Welcome to Shoot Me Straight. Here today we have a different type of episode. We are talking about entrepreneurship, and we have a couple buddies with us. Um, they're younger guys. They are up and coming, really growing uh, businesses and growing in their knowledge of entrepreneurship. And what's really cool about them so far as I've gotten to know them is just their hunger and, and really super teachable. They These guys really want to know, which is for guys that have been around and started businesses, started companies, gone through the ups and downs, it's really, I, I find a lot of entrepreneurs love to help others come up and they want their success and to have a group of guys, I've had it around me that um, just really help a startup get off the ground and get going or how to mature to the next level. Uh, having other founders is super helpful. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my name is Matthew Rusnat. I'm a recent UF graduate. Um, I've been into social media pretty much ever since I was about 13 years old, starting with Instagram pages, meme pages, stuff like that. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, be able to grow and scale online businesses uh, over the past few years, generate a good chunk of income and uh, right now, I guess I'd say my title is like a social media creator, manager, influencer. So I'm really heavily into Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, that sort of stuff. Yeah, 100%. Alex? Oh, um, I'm Alex Kilpatrick. I'm a rising senior at Duke University. Um, I guess my title would be student athlete. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, as far as entrepreneurship goes, I've just spent a lot of time. I'm in the entrepreneurship program at Duke, and I've spent a lot of time learning from a lot of cool businesses. Um, last summer, I worked with uh, this duck waiter company called Shin, and I've gotten to talk to Dave, David a little bit, and yeah. Awesome. Hey, it, the entrepreneurship program there at Duke, do they like bring in founders and yes, owners? a lot of them. Um, so my... So sophomore or freshman summer it was during COVID but there's Duke and Silicon Valley it's a program where they send all the students to California and they go and we would go meet everybody but we were virtual and so we met like I met Apple's um vice president I can't remember his name um the uh a bunch of other companies Uber um What's the um, Airbnb, Airbnb's yep. founder and stuff. And so, yeah, they've introduced us to a lot of cool people. And I've been able, I've been fortunate um, to be able to pick a lot of cool brains and hear a lot of cool stories. And yeah. What's crazy is when you do go to San Francisco and you look at the, uh, you actually go buy the business. I've, I've been to Twitter and Airbnb, like Airbnb is this little, it's almost, you, you almost don't recognize where the building is. It's in this little like side not alley, but like a side part of this building. I don't know if they moved since I've been there, but like going in the, and then it opens up into a huge oh, really? area in there. Twitter is at the bottom base of Twitter is like a cafeteria lunch area. It's like a store slash um, like really organic lunch area. And then you take elevators up to actually get into the offices and actual Twitter. No way. It's Does, pretty cool. Have you been since Elon took it over? No. I wonder no. how different it looks. I don't know. Who knows? It's 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 really cool. Like S San Francisco to me, it's like the coolest place and the worst mm -hmm. place. Oh, it's, yeah. it's like, man, such an incredible place. So much innovation. I mean, that little hub has changed the world in in – I mean, possibly one of the, like, as far as location-wise, has changed the world in such a huge impact, and yet, like, it's, the city itself has been just so mismanaged. Definitely. I uh, went out there for, a, I had a track meet in um, Sacramento, my freshman year of high school, and I went to, my dad was like, bring a, it's like 112 in Sacramento or whatever, and my dad's like, bring a hoodie and jeans, we're going to go to San Francisco, and I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> Sure enough, you cross that bridge, it is cold in the yeah. middle. Of the, it is really, I guess, geographically or whatever, it's, like, really, really cool, however all that works. Um, yeah. It sucks that it's gotten the way it has because, yeah. I mean, it's so cool. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's pretty similar to Los Angeles almost. You know, the entire year it's, like, 70, 75 degrees around there. There's never any winter over there. 
Yeah. It's never really raining. And yeah, and Los Angeles is pretty similar to San Francisco too, mm-hmm. except it's more Hollywood than tech based. Mm-hmm. And I also feel like it's been pretty mismanaged too. Yeah. And it's sad to see because there's so much money that's being generated in Los Angeles and San Francisco, but mm-hmm. they just can't put that money towards the correct things. Yeah. Yeah, in 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 my my view of it, it's probably political. Like politics screws everything up, man. Can we just like do away with politics, period? Let's just get a king. Yeah. Let's just get a king. <laughs> just have a bottom. <laughs> Wait, That's did we a... introduce Trip? Oh, we didn't. Trip. <laughs> DJ don't trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh this is the first time I've ever actually been on the podcast. But my title is Shoot me straight, employee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Trip Martin. I uh, I work with David. I've worked with David for two summers now. Last summer, we did some marketing for his uh, CRM company, Repbox, and now we're doing stuff for the podcast. So I run all the social media. I do all the clipping, all the engineering, so the cameras, the audio equipment, everything. So. Yeah, pretty much everything. Plug well, <laughs> your DJ gig. Who are you yeah. as a DJ? Oh, yeah. I also DJ under the name of Don't Trip. Uh, check me out. <laughs> yeah. And you're a hairstylist as of? As of yesterday, I cut my own hair. <laughs> you're really selling yourself short, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was- Trip <laughs> Trip is amazing. Like, pretty much everything with the podcast, Trip does. He's, I mean, he's always switching. He's in the background. But then is putting together the full episodes. He's making clips. He's growing social media. He's been delving into sponsorship and stuff like that, too, lately. Um, he's he's a godsend. Super appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> um, so ha- help me understand uh, your background in your Instagram page has like two million followers. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, I told you that I was starting with meme pages since I was like 13 years old. And then it came around to, I think it was like 2017 or 2018, Fortnite released, which was absolutely huge in the grander scheme of things. But back then, I was running like pages for all these different video games. And I just had the idea to start a page for Fortnite itself because it just made sense. All my friends were playing it. And I purchased one shout out for like $50 from this, uh, the biggest Fortnite page at the time. It had like 100,000 followers. And I ended up getting like 6,000 followers from that. And ever since then, I haven't spent a single dollar on Fortnite. And it's just grown organically to, uh, it, at one point it was above 2 million. Since then, it's kind of petered out a little bit. I think we're at like 1.9 right now. And it's just, uh, it's been a wild ride. I'm, how did you not, how did you grow it organically? So you brought it 2017? I started it, I think January of 2018. Okay. Uh-huh. So, I mean, that's five years. When you said you purchased one shout out for fifty bucks, yes. What's a shout out from an influencer? Yeah, so it was like Fortnite memes. I think is what the page was called, and I ran <laughs> like a like a fifty dollar Amazon card giveaway, mm. and uh, it was only supposed to last for like ten to twelve hours. But the dude who was running the page was super lazy. He accidentally left it up for like two days. And uh, that ended up getting me, like, double or triple what I was supposed to get. Um, but, yeah, typically when you spend $50 on anything social media related, you'll get, like, maybe 50, 100 followers. But back then, it was, like, the Wild West of Instagram. Yeah. How many followers were you at when you were when you bought the shout-out? Zero. It was literally oh, the, wow. the first day that I started the page. And then, you know, from there, I started posting four, five, six times per day. And back then, the algorithm was a lot different. Nowadays, it's super short-form content-heavy, like reels, stuff like that. But back then, you could post memes, whatever you want. Just try to hit the Explore page. And if you hit the Explore page, that's how you skyrocketed. And there was at one point where I was gaining five, ten thousand 10,000 followers per day just from posting, you know, four or five times a day. What do you mean hit the Explore page? So, you know, whenever you're on Instagram, there's, like, the search feature on the second tab. And then you see all of those different tiles. That's the Explore page. And back then, that was really the only way to grow besides, like, shout-outs and stuff like that. Yeah. Interesting. Where would you learn this? Um, I guess it's just from personal experience. You know, I, I've been doing this since I was, like, 13. And, um, you know, I, I built, like, a group of friends that were super into Instagram and stuff like that. And we'd all share, like, these little secrets between each other. Um and, yeah, I, I was really just 
my entire life was dedicated to this page. I was posting two, three, every two, three hours on there. So. Yeah. So how did, so do you think a lot had to be attributed with your timing? Is 2018 Instagram, what, had Facebook bought them yet? Yes, yes. I think okay. they bought them back in like 2013 or s- super early. Okay. Yeah. So, so social media, it, it was, it was booming then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was definitely probably the biggest social media platform. Nowadays, it's probably, I think TikTok is definitely the fastest growing. I don't know if it's the biggest, but. The biggest is Facebook. Facebook I know that. Oh yeah, yeah. Facebook, just because of the sheer, like, longevity and market volume and a lot of, um, they captured a lot of, I believe, they captured a lot of baby boomers. Yes. Right? That that got used to a platform in general. You know, with someone, you know, older they are, like their ability to learn new tech usually declines, Absolutely. right? And they get familiar with a platform. And it's not that they couldn't do Instagram or TikTok or any of those other things. But with baby boomers, a lot of times they're like, hey, you, like, I don't want to learn something else. I understand this. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so it's just familiar. Yeah, it's funny you say that because uh, pretty much everybody that's past our generation like, they don't even try to get into Instagram as heavy, but, like, my mom, my dad, my stepdad, my grandma, they're all super heavy into Facebook. Mm-hmm. You know, they have Instagram accounts, but they don't post on it because Facebook is almost for that demographic. Mm-hmm. In Instagram, I'd say, is probably, like, you know, at this point, it's probably tw- 28 and under just because the people mm-hmm. that have been grandfathered in. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I would probably include older millennials. Older millennials are right at that edge, like, where I would be. So I'm 39, and at 39, you know, with with TikTok and other ones, like my wife will show me stuff, and I'm like, man, I, oh, you just do this, you know. If, if, if I let my kids do it, they'd be like, oh, Dad, just swipe left, and like, oh, okay. Yeah. But, like, I think, I think one big thing, though, with you have a newer platform like Instagram that hits, the ability to time it and come on to it earlier – you can get so much more viral on it because they're pushing for user for people to use it. And so you can get real viral on it when you try and come in and like launch something off Facebook. It's not that you can't, um, depends on your plan, but like in your demographic, but, but your ability to go viral like that on Facebook versus like a TikTok, you know, with TikTok being newer, you tend to timing, I think is where it, on your side earlier on on a social media platform yeah yeah absolutely and it's funny that you mentioned timing because um you know i got into fortnite right when it was starting to blow up but it was before it went absolutely like nuclear so you know there's a couple of pages that were around 100k ish but um being able to get in there early it allowed me to get in front of all these you know new people that are trying to get into the fortnite niche Mm -hmm. um so yeah timing is one of the biggest things in business in general, um, even with startups, mm-hmm. things like that. Hundred percent. So, so six thousand. How did you get it to two million? Uh, really, just grinding, posting every day. Um, I'd collaborate with, you know, some other pages. Um, you know, like shout out for shout out. Uh-huh. Uh, nowadays, that doesn't work as well. But there's like collab posts on Instagram. That's like the new way to do it. Um, but yeah, it was really just posting four or five times a day. Back then, the algorithm would push you out if people, uh, I guess, liked your content. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's harder to grow in followers on Instagram because it's so heavily short-form content-centered. And just the way that the Instagram UI is set up, there's no easy way to follow someone from an Instagram reel. As Mm -hmm. opposed to, like, TikTok, if you try to tap on somebody's TikTok, like, profile, there's, like, a plus, like, on the profile so you, like, half the time you'll accidentally follow someone on TikTok. But mm. Instagram, you have to click on their profile and then follow them. So yeah. it's it's a lot harder to grow on Instagram nowadays. Wow. Do you think that um, TikTok is so rapidly growing because the entirety of it, I feel like, is based on the For You page? Yeah, yeah. I, I just think that they have by far the best algorithm out of any social media platform. Um, they've always had, like, a really good algorithm for growing people but it's hard for them to monetize and recently there's been a shift from you know short form 10 15 second videos um recently they're trying to switch to longer form like one minute plus to 
around 10 minutes. And actually, they just implemented something called the creativity program. And if you post videos that are longer than a minute, they'll pay you similar amounts of money to YouTube uh, CPMs. Mm. So I actually have one friend. He, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he has like four or five million followers across all of his accounts. And he'll just post like funny content, but it's all over a minute long. And he's generating 30, 40, 50K a month mm. just straight off of TikTok videos, which wow. if you would have told me that like four or five years ago, that's like, I, I would Insane. not have believed you. Yeah. It's crazy. Did, so how did you start monetizing? Did you, f- when you started growing, you were hustling, you weren't making any money off of it. You Did you have like a plan to monetize it from the beginning? Or were you like, hey, I just love this. I want to see how much I can grow it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I started the page out of passion because, you know, I played Fortnite every day. Back then, I think all of us played Fortnite probably <laughs> like five hours a day. Uh, yeah. Just trying to get victory royales. Um, and yeah, at a, at a certain point, people started reaching out to me. Uh, I think it was around like 60, 70,000 followers. They'd start DMing me, asking me to promote either their Fortnite page or their drop shipping uh, website. That was really big back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I pretty much generated all my money either through affiliate programs like Sweatcoin was a really big one and uh, just story ads and like giveaway posts, stuff like that. Story ads? Yeah. So like Instagram stories, like I'll just promote somebody on my Instagram story. Back Got then it. I was pulling like 100, 200,000 views on my story. Um, so, you know, people want to pay for that many impressions. Literally one button and you're getting paid for it. Like exactly. Add to story. Yeah, like I, I'd be in stool, somebody would DM me, I'd post their thing, you know, maybe two minutes of work, and that's like 50, 60 bucks right there. Wow. So, you know, you post like four or five, six of those a day. It was it was dead money. Yeah, so you're 20, well, you're 22, 23? 21. 21, okay. And I started this back when I was like 16. 16? 16. Wait, yeah. 16. How much were you making at 17, 18? Um, I'd say... Probably my best year was around like ninety to one hundred k. Um, I, I'd have a couple of months where um, <laughs> I'd pull in like a, a five figure month, which was the craziest feeling back then. Because yeah. you know, I, I went from making nothing to all this money. Um, Alex just started crying sitting there. <laughs> I mean, didn't you about get, that. I don't know if I remember this correctly. Didn't you get a car in high school with the fourth night stuff? No, I, I might have, like, joked around about that, okay. but, I mean, I could have. I, I'm still driving my same beat-up Nissan Altima 2013. Um, I pretty Free. much try to save as much money as possible. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, it's been a ride. Wow. So, at it, it, 18 years old, you're making 90K <laughs> for the year. What, did, did you have – when that started happening – did you start to then think, hey, where am I going to go with this? What's the longer term plan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially with things like Fortnite, which are like super trend heavy, you know, uh, one game will take over the space for, you know, maybe a few months, maybe a year tops. But Fortnite was different. It lasted, you know, two, three, four years. I mean, it's still growing. I think it's still one of the most popular Battle Royale games at the moment. Mm. Um but yeah, as soon as I started like generating good money off of it, I was thinking, when is this going to end? There, there's no way that this can last forever. And, you know, that caused me, you know, both like anxiety, but also like, how am I going to build after this? Um, and yeah, I, I pretty much just turned it into a social media management business. That's kind of what I do right now. I manage social media accounts for different companies, different corporations, Nice. Uh, actually, my main source of revenue right now is for working for a tech company, a, a startup. I do their social media because um, as, you know, Fortnite kind of petered out in revenue as the algorithm changed, I wasn't able to generate as much. So I kind of had to pivot into a different business model. Mm-hmm. Yep. How do you get in contact with uh, these corporations and stuff that you're working with? Yeah, um, so basically once you get into uh, social media and you grow a big enough page, people will start to, uh, you know, just reach out to you. You'll build connections. Um, you know, I, uh, I worked for FaZe, those kinds of people, for, you know, six, seven months. And through that, I built a lot of connections with different startup founders, different 
you know, creators in the space. And then, uh, you know, people would start reaching out to me to uh, manage their social media because mm-hmm. they saw, you know, I have a proven track record. And, you know, especially nowadays, social media is one of the biggest ways to grow your business. Um, so, yeah, it's really just having the, the track record um, and people mm-hmm. will start coming to you. Yeah. Has anybody ever offered to buy Fortnite? Yeah, yeah. There was a there was a point uh, where somebody offered like a good amount of money, and I was ready to get the deal done. It was like two years ago. The page was at its peak, um, but for whatever reason, it, it fell through. They wanted to, uh, I don't know. There's some like weird terms to the deal, and it, it might not have been like an actual deal. Maybe they're just like seeing if they could get it for that price, but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've had multiple people offer me for it, but I never really wanted to sell it because it kind of became my identity. You know, it it was like part of, you know, how I generated my money. It's the biggest thing on my resume and it was my life for like four or five years. So it was almost like parting with my baby and Mm -hmm. I I, I didn't want to do that. But yeah, yeah. a few people understand. So like if you just work, I mean, if you've been loyal to a company for years and have a real good place in there. There's, there's a sense of like ownership, but not like you actually owning and starting something from the get go. Mm -hmm. You know, we, with Redbox, I've had lots of different, like every day I get emailed something from some VC company or something that's like, Hey, we want to buy you for this amount. And you're like, how you can't make an offer. Like this is BS. A lot of people talk. Right. And so, but, but it's your, it is like your baby. Have you ever thought about exiting rep box? Like selling and getting out? Uh, I've, it'd have to be the right thing. Okay. Um, I, I, you never say never for, for like an acquisition to be like, I'm never gonna, um, sell it, but it would have to be the right thing because you become, it, I, I think, for good founders, you become so grateful and indebted to your customers. Mm -hmm. Like my customers, I wouldn't have this if it wasn't for them. I wouldn't, you know, my life's incredible. And I wouldn't have it if it wasn't for these guys that trusted me, especially early on guys that came on board as customers. Mm -hmm. Those guys hadn't trusted me. I wouldn't have what I have today. So I'm not going to do anything that isn't in their best interest as well. I think good founders are like that, and you build that trust with the with the customer. So, say like a company uh, came to you, and you've had good relationships with them in the past, and you know that they're good good people that would run your company well and take care of your business. Would you start to consider selling to them if they give you the right number? Well, we've had someone court us, right? That that, and it's about the only one that would make sense. That I know that they would do right by the customer. I know that they want to come in and change other people's systems and how they have things set up. And, um, that I know, I know that they would, that they would be the right ones to do it. Um, I would consider that, uh, it'd have to be, it'd have to be the right price, but just, just as importantly has to be the right plan. The thing is that a lot of people, um, in a traditional business sense, SaaS is very different. It, it is. It's like business on steroids. It's super hard to start one and get it going. And, I mean, it's it's infinitely harder than just starting any other service or product-based company. But when a SaaS begins to take off, it's it's the opposite. You can automate so much. You can, you know, if I'm if I have a home-building company, Right, like in order to build more homes and double my output, I have to hire more people, and and as it gets growing bigger, I have to come up with a bigger structure, managers on managers. Like, it, there's only so f- much I can do with the amount of people. With a SaaS, if I need to duplicate something, you know, with a home, you got to go build another home. With a SaaS, if I need to duplicate something, like I literally write one line in a terminal and give it about, you know, a minute and it's duplicated an entire system. Yeah, because it's just software. You're not having to sell a physical product that you're manufacturing the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually work for technically a SaaS. Um, 
Potter is the name of the company. Uh, we're a data infrastructure and visualization company. Yep. And uh, right now we're building out an application. We really want to get a lot of gamers into there. Um, I, I can dive the whole way into it. But yeah, exactly is what you're saying with like home building. Mm-hmm. Sure, you can make a ton of money, especially around here, mm-hmm. but you can't scale it the same way that you scale a SaaS. And Correct. That's why CRMs, uh, you know, social media networks, everything online, it's especially with the internet, there's infinite leverage um, compared to, you know, a physical product. Yeah, there is. It, it's it's what's difficult that a lot of people don't understand, even techies, like they don't necessarily understand everything with a SaaS, right? Like to to build out a system or do a, I'll take data visualization, for example, to do a Microsoft BI or a, a Tableau, like you know, to do that for one company, to build out their dashboards and everything for one company, it's one thing. Mm-hmm. But to build a system that can work for multiple companies and can get deployed and they can make their connections and you have an API later, layer and you do all these things, it's like there's a lot to it. But once you build those in, if you have the right vision and right plan, once you build those in, I mean, I work on Rutbox a couple hours a day, maybe. Yeah. Right? And, like, it runs itself, you know? And when someone comes on, I, I don't know half the customers now, right? Like, my, my guys do. But when a customer comes on, they don't have to wait for something to get built or done. Like, it deploys it. Like, it deploys a de- it deploys the database. It deploys the code. Like, all that stuff's been, you know, it took... took years getting there which is really difficult when you're bootstrapping a SaaS. the other model is typical um, you know silicon valley model which is like you know load up on vc make it to your next round you get through your your uh, seed and then make it to you know you're just looking to get to the next round of funding Mm -hmm. and you're just building this massive thing and but you're you're not actually making money yet (laughs) you know and they're doubling down doubling down on marketing 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 and instead with if you bootstrap it right you're broke poor you're doing everything you're trying to just make it better and better and better every day but you also get that discipline like there's not a day go that goes by now that rep buck doesn't get better Mm -hmm. like it's always being worked on it's always being tweaked it's always getting um, more integrations and stuff like that. So I think of if if you do assess and you can hold out long enough on a bootstrap and you're able to somehow manage to get up that hill, man, it's it's incredible on the other side. If you do VC, then you got a lot of people to answer to. You're trying to get to the next round. you got employees. And you're just building up a huge infrastructure that you're not necessarily – personally ready for yet Mm -hmm. some people are but yeah yeah absolutely and especially uh as opposed to the vc model if you're bootstrapping you get complete ownership so it's so Mm. much more satisfying once you actually make it um because yeah potter is running through the vc model we raised seed funding about this time last year we raised i think 2.5 at a 10 mil evaluation and now we're going for series a funding but it's exactly as you said you're just trying to extend your runway as long as possible and just trying not to die before you run out of money yeah it's not it's not wrong right like neither way is wrong right it's not like oh that's because there are some ways that it's like hey that's don't do that (laughs) (laughs) but like it's just two different models one is trying to make a huge pie as like fast as possible and to get it up to like a ginormous scale. Um, but like, it's just a different game, right? And the bootstrap one is trying to get in the black, you know, as soon as possible so that, man, you're, you can eat, you can like, but you're also, you're dedicating 24 seven to it. And you're running multiple role. Like, you know, it was me out of my house for years. And my wife going, and, and a lot of times going, man, I don't know if, I don't know how we're going to make it this month, but I'm going to figure out a way. But at the, at, on the other side of it, 
when it does begin to take off and get over that first hill. I mean, when, I remember when we first, I was I was just trying to get it to five grand a month so that we could live. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife just had baby number one. Oh wow! Where I'm working out of this little room in the back, and I'm like, I I wake up at seven and I'm like marketing through the day and then spend time with the kids and their kid and and my wife and then eat dinner and then I'm working until one two in the morning coding. Wow! You know and. I had a moment where we went, you know, I, I don't think we're going to make it this month. I have to figure out something. And I was supplicant, suppl- supplementing things by, like, doing websites and stuff like that. But I was like, I, I have to dedicate full time to this. So I had a buddy that knew a manufacturer rep that lived in Dallas. I went to his office. He wasn't there. And I said, I'll, it's all right. I'll just wait till he gets back from lunch. And I just waited there. Didn't have a meeting. Didn't he didn't know me? And I was like, introduced myself when he came in and was like, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna meet with you <laughs> for a minute. Like, and if, if if I need to wait here all day, I will. And he's like, okay, come on back. And I showed him rep box, but I knew that he was a part of a bigger association. And when you really understand your customer and you nail like nail their pain points, and, and all the big ones, and they. I mean, it's, it's not a sell. It's, it's a fix. It's you're going, they're going, dude, this, this is exactly what we need. You know, it's like someone, it it was, it would be like a door to door salesman coming in here uh, like an hour ago and going, Hey, do you need a mic stand by chance? (laughs) Like that's not a sell. Like, yes, we do. You nailed it. And it's, he goes, you know what? We have a big meeting going in Nashville why don't you come and I want you to present to all 12 companies that are out there. Wow. I went and I presented. And when I presented, I, I just literally said, screw it. I'm just going to show you exactly what it does and like ran through it. And they were like, holy smokes, this is it. Like I nailed, I, I got all 12 companies as customers that day, wow. which was about a hundred K worth. And I, I mean, I called home. I'm like, yes, <laughs> like those moments as an entrepreneur are incredible, but also as an entrepreneur, there are moments that it's like lonely. And even when you get like really good employees and team, no one owns it like you do. And so, like, there's times that it's just like, what the heck am I doing? Like, should I stop? Like, should I just go get a nine to five? Um, cause you're not working for a paycheck. I mean, you're working for a passion and the more it's closer aligned to your passion, the better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when you were starting RepBots, when you were bootstrapping it, were you running completely off of savings? Were you taking out loans? I know it, it sounds like you weren't really working a job back then. Mm-mm. Um, you were dedicating all of your time to this. How were you funding that? How were you surviving while you were building RepBots? We were we were running off savings, but we also I would do websites at periodic times. I'd get a website in order to supplement. So like I get a website for 10k or 15k to build out someone's website. Oh, okay. So people uh, would just reach out to you and ask. So. I would I would I would make connections and and you know, I mean who doesn't need a website right? And so like websites are easy. In fact, like that, that literally Clouder is the website company that I just had out of necessity to build up Redbox. And I did it that way. Um, I took on one guy that was a little bit of cash. He was 25K um, in the beginning, but uh, he was also a manufacturer up. So it was strategic in the sense that he had a vested interest in helping me get other customers that were in his in his space and so he was he was super helpful but like that that was that was it like I mean the rest of it was just like and we tried to get legitimate customers and those initial customers was like hey like I will do whatever but you're also learning there's a point like if you just jumped in and you hadn't ran or founded a SaaS company before 
there's so much learning. Like the day I quit my job, um, and I was I was making a hundred thousand dollars or so before, and I quit it to start this. Um, it the day I did that, like from that day on, I learned more every day than I had in like years previously. And I had a bachelor's in, in computer science and business and then a master's in counseling. And between those two, I actually used the master's in counseling more in a software company than computer science because, like, what what you really – you didn't – like, how much from U of F did – like, that's what really helped you do your Fortnite – like, no. You already had it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you just learn so much more by being in the jungle, you know, working in actual companies, building your own businesses, you know, with a marketing major, they try to teach you social media and how to market to people, but they can't get specific enough to where they provide, you know, the real value to people that are trying to get into these social media creator influencer management positions. You have to actually put the work in. Um, I think, Probably with comp sci, that's a little bit different because you're actually learning the coding part of it. But, you know, how much of that are you actually having to code yourself and how much are you pulling from, um, you know, different GitHub. websites? Yeah, GitHub, exactly. And different people to put it into your code. It's more of a mm-hmm. creative effort than, you know, just learning it from somewhere and copying and pasting it into um, a certain business model. And what's tough is it changes so fast, right? Like, like you even said, like 2018 – algorithm for Instagram like what would work back then would be different today and so for a school that's why with Duke uh, that's really cool they bring in current day founders and and marketing specialists and all that because to get the real world experience from it current day super helpful you know I I, there's fundamental things I'm not a fan of people that are like you know You should never go to college. Like, don't go to college. Just start. It's like, okay, some people, yes, like, do that. Take that route. But most people, like, college is a really cool time to just, if you get anything, it's how to learn. Like, and also, also being around people. I think especially, like, being in a college, in the college environment, getting to meet other brilliant people with other different skill sets. It's not so much about, hey, well, man, from this business class, like, I'm an expert at business law or whatever. It's like, okay, well, that's – whatever you learn there next year is going to be different. But you – with college, you get – there's something about someone going through four years, committing to it, getting through it, and there's a level of confidence to coming out of it as a professional. However – as an entrepreneur, there's some guys that it's like, hey, man, you are, you got the gene. And for better or for worse, right? There's, that's good. And man, there's bad parts to it too. But like, you know, college could be a distraction where it's like, hey, get after it, man. It, it was good for me because I hated college. I was not, I'm not good at school. And for, and I didn't think I was going to graduate high school even. So for me to get a college degree was, more cathartic for me, um, especially getting a master's. I never dreamed of that. But, like, even in classes, I would be coding something else during the class while they're teaching something, you know, and then I have to go back and figure out, like, you know, whatever the assignment was. But I'd be coding other things. Yeah, so would you say to you it was more of an obstacle stopping you from working on your actual passions or do you think it was valuable enough to where, uh, you know, it provided value in your entrepreneurship endeavors? Looking back now, I think it was valuable because it helped me mature. Mm. It helped me mature professionally. I didn't grow up in that environment. I grew up in, my dad was, my dad was professor, but like we were pretty, we're pretty lower middle class. Like, we're pretty poor. Like, I grew up with around a lot of people that had really poor man's mentality. Like, you know, just just whatever you do, just secure a job that's 50K a year and you got it made. And that's, like, no pushing yourself, no growing, no uh, the sky's the limit. Like, I didn't grow up around that 
Um, so for me to grow professionally and just mature as an adult, it was helpful. Um, cause when you, cause when you start doing things, cause I was B to B, I was, it wasn't B to C, it wasn't consumers. I was, I was going to businesses. And so I'm dealing with owners, owners of companies. And a lot of these owners of companies were for like later forties, early fifties. Like I needed to grow professionally. I don't, I, I think it's good for most people at college, but there are cases where it's like, dude, this dude's just got it. And like, man, go ahead, go for it. Zuckerberg or whoever, like, like drop out, like just, just go for your niche. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when they have the idea that's like taken off, but like, why not just grow, like make sure it's taken off before you just <laughs> jump out of college. Yeah, it seems like the best thing is, like, to go to college. Not the best for everybody, but, like, and then unless you, like, have a startup that's blowing up, like, it has to pull you out of it, I feel like. You know what I mean? Like, Zuckerberg and Elon and them, they went to college, but they got pulled out of it by themselves or by their Mm -hmm. business that they created. Um, Yeah, yeah, but I was the same way with school where I, like, where I'm in school right now and, like, a professor will teach me something. and I'm busy researching wherever my mind wanders the whole time, and then I get home and I'm like, look at my notes and there's nothing on there, like <laughs> some scribbles or something like that. And it's like, damn, I've got to teach myself the entire lesson. Yeah. It's, it, it was good for me though. Cause it, there's a sense of accomplishment when it's like, Hey, this was really hard. I, like I'm not a naturally good at college or class. And yet I still push through. And like that, I think the number one characteristic with entrepreneurs is grit. If you, if you have grit, Man, you can you can overcome so much. You you cannot be an expert at anything really, but you have grit to figure out a way. You're gonna figure out a way, and you can. And I guess probably some vision mm-hmm. to say, "Hey, here's where I want to go." And grit, you can figure out. What, you don't have to. You don't have to code. You don't have to. If 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 it's another type of business, you don't have to be an expert at the trade. You you can outsource just about anything. But you have to have the grit to, like, figure out the path. Yeah, I mean, you look at someone like Steve Jobs, if you've seen that movie or, like, read his uh, biography, he wasn't great at coding. He wasn't great at, uh, you know, well, he was a visionary, so he was good at the marketing side. But you read about the, the days that he'll just get kicked out of his business and he'll come back, he'll keep working, he'll keep visualizing how to work at this company that doesn't even want him. Mm-hmm. He has the grit. He had the the genius to visualize what he wanted Apple to be. And yeah, the greatest entrepreneurs, they can survive obstacles that would knock off most people. Um, you know, a lot of people I see that are around my age, they'll try to, you know, develop something like a clothing brand or, um, you know, a drop shipping site. And they'll have one business fail and they'll just stop there. Mm-hmm. But Really, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to enjoy the process of failing. You have to, you know, put in the work and get the five, six different businesses that fail before you get lucky, before mm. you hit it big. Um, and you have to enjoy, you know, almost failing. Yeah, you will fail. Like, <laughs> even if, like, your first idea was the one that sh- shot, like, you're going to fail along the way getting it there. Mm-hmm. You're going to mismanage that. But, like, you learn like uh, me and Francesca talk about this my wife a lot is we learn from things like so you as you get more success and like you begin to switch into investment mindset too which is a different type of thinking especially if you've saved right you've lived below your means you've saved and now it's like, hey, this doesn't need to just be sitting here. We need to begin investing and having a vision for investing. You, you're you're going to make bad – like you should fail some. If you don't fail at all, I would say, hey, you're not going for it because risk risk isn't bad. Risk is, is actually a good – you should be taking risk. The level of risk and what kind of risk it is – doing your research, stuff like that, 100%. But you always need, if you really want to grow, grow wealth, also just grow as a person, you need to always be in some level of risk and putting yourself out there. And I think 
when entrepreneurs do that, you're going to fail, but you're going to learn. So it's like, okay, that's a, we just had one the other day where we're like, okay, that's a $200,000 lesson. Like, I mean, 100% and it stings, but you like a man, that mistake won't ever happen again. Like that, it, it doesn't mean that I don't take risk anymore. It just, you learn from that and you tweak it and you become more and more successful. If you learn from them, your successes will get better. Mm-hmm. And, and your your criteria of judging things will get better. Like you, you ever have someone that, that comes on and they're like, oh, like I have this great idea. I'm going to pitch it to you. And like a little bit, I mean, 10 seconds in, you're like, oh, that's a bad idea. <laughs> like that's not going to work. The reason you know that is because you've been through all these different things or someone will come to me and be like, hey, we should do this. How We want to have this done. How should it be done? I'll think it in my head and I'll think, okay, this way. Nope, 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 nope. Like there's 20 ways to do it, 19 of them. I'm like, uh, no, 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 because I've done them all. Because you've been down all those different paths and you failed at all those. You know where all the dead ends are. Yeah. But you also see the path forward. Mm-hmm. So you, yeah. you can provide a lot of value to other people that are coming up in the space. Like, do you have any friends that, you know, they saw your success and they wanted to follow in your footsteps and you've tried to help them out in their entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. And I've gotten better at that too. So you learn how to help people when you're trying to help another entrepreneur. You're not going to be like, Hey, here's a sheet of like, do this, do this, do this, do this. You may tell them things. Hey, these are the things like top things to focus on. But a lot of it is, Hey, I'm going to share my experience with them, but they're on their own path and journey. A lot of us have to learn through our experience. So you want to let them have those experiences, but you can for sure warn them of super like pitfalls of like, yeah, yeah, that try it. That may work, but just don't do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think something that's super cool, like about being young and with school and everything, like I think we were lucky because we all went to school with each other. Like, I mean, these guys like have always had like a vision and stuff like that. And it was always cool to be in English class with, with Matt and just watch him talking to 2 million people in the middle of English class and stuff like that. And I feel like what's cool and what's valuable about school is, like, networking and stuff like that. Like, if you don't find it in high school, you'll find the people in college. And, like, you're climbing the ladder, but, like, they're raising the floor, if that makes any sense. Mm. So your fall is not that far. It it doesn't feel like that. Like, whenever, like, I feel like trip motivates me all the time to, like, think outside of, like, what I would normally think of. Like, think big and stuff like that. And I really think – like stuff like that has proven to be really helpful. Like I was, I would talk to my buddies at school. Like I had this idea, what do you think of it? And they're like, all right, well, let's think about all the ways that it could fail. And then I, so through the entrepreneurship program, we are assigned a mentor. Somehow mine is from Dustin. Um, she, it was crazy of all, like I thought it was a joke, but it was real. And um, yeah. And so I was talking to her and I was pitching an idea, like asking her, like, what should I consider to fail? Like what, what could be wrong? And she asked me every single question about, like, what could go wrong that my friends had already thought about with me. And Mm. it was so cool to have already had the answers to her questions because I worked with, like, my buddies. I surrounded myself with a group. And, like, we talked about it while we were playing Fortnite, like, (laughs) literally. Like, it all came full circle. And I think it's really cool. Like, I don't know. I think, like, a community is super big with all this. Well, that's that's what I was going to say about, like, college in general. Whether or not you actually learn from, like, like, I've had professors that I do think I've learned a lot from. And I've had some that I feel like I haven't learned that much from. But I do feel like the cool thing about going to school and getting that experience is you make those connections. Like, even in, even connections you don't think are going to be important later in life, like, you you make these, like, small little connections. And, like, ultimately, like, that's what brought me to go to school in Austin and, like, go to the business school at University of Texas is because, like, I thought I had other options where I wanted to go. But I thought, you know what? This is somewhere that's, like, booming right now. Austin is taking off. I'm going to go out there and hopefully make connections that will be invaluable later in life. And I feel like that's kind of what's happened to me. Like whether or not I know it yet, I feel like that's what has college has done for me that I like, I'm going to find the most value out of. 100%. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like you'll meet someone in your business class and you know, you'll get their Instagram and maybe like six months later, they'll see that you're DJing or you're um, working at some gig. And then they'll ask you, How'd you get into that? Um, maybe I can help you pr- promote it. Like they do their own marketing, their own social media. 
But if you never would have met them in the past, you wouldn't have had that business opportunity. Mm. All these small little butterfly effects just from meeting certain people change your life so much. And I think being in a college, especially like UT Austin or Duke, um, you're around so many people that are going to be going on these crazy life paths and having insane visions for themselves. And if you can even be a part of 10% of a few different people's lives, those percentages will completely change your future. Yeah, I, I think that's why college is probably more valuable for networking unless you're into, you know, like STEM, if you're into nursing, law, medicine, if you're into business majors, sociology, um, it's much more valuable to network and be with other like, like-minded people. 100%. It's funny that you mentioned like the, you mentioned the people being like meet, making connections that you don't mean to make because when I started like performing music, I literally did it because I was the social chairman of my fraternity and we had multiple artists fall through and I was like, screw this. We need to have somebody that can just do it. So I taught myself how to do it through just YouTube and everything. And now I'm like actually getting paid to play events here. I'm playing events in Austin. And one of the craziest connections is I, when I was the social chairman, I used this website called beat gig to book artists. And now I'm an artist on beat gig just because I made the connection with those guys. Like I was always, they were always super helpful to me. And when I started doing it, I would reach out to them and I'm like, yo, let me, let me see if I can get myself out there a little bit and do all this stuff. And they've been super helpful to me and everything. Shout out beat gig, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, DJ trip, but, don't trip. Don't trip, yeah. <laughs> don't trip. But no, it's just funny that you make those connections that you don't think. I mean, I was the social chairman booking artists for my fraternity. I didn't think that anything would come out of me meeting those guys. And but, then you started booking yourself. And now now I'm literally on the website and could like, if I was still the social chairman, I could literally book myself through the website. Yeah. But You're the artist getting booked by social chairman. Yes. <laughs> well, one thing I, th- I do think with community and helping other entrepreneurs that is, I'd almost say essential, but, but super helpful is you got, you have generational, uh, a generational gap there where you have younger guys that tend to be more techie in this world is becoming more and more tech. And you have older guys that have years and years of experience in business and uh, just over maturity in general, I think, and I really do think God designed things this way that younger guys need old, need older guys like mentorship. Older guys they need to also have peers that are in their circle in their community, um, and then as they get as they're growing, they also have guys under them that they're helping and mentoring them. And when you have older guys need younger guys as well. And so, you know, I'm 39. I'm on the, more on the edge of millennial. But I need, you know, I need a trip. You, you know, different things. Like there's tons of stuff, especially social media marketing. Why is that, man, that I could default to you guys, that I could learn from you guys on and – Vice versa, as far as just years of experience running businesses and and so forth, I I I don't see a lot of guys my age and older really developing the relationships with younger guys, um, and I think that's to their disadvantage and to the young guys' disadvantage that you have guys that will help guide them, not by telling them what to do, but really by more good questions, helping them grow in how they think. Mm -hmm. One of the best things that I, like I said, I use my master's in counseling. I use the counseling experience more than I use my computer science degree in running a tech company because I've learned to listen and I've learned to ask good questions. And when you're in a business, you're dealing with people and learning how, learning about people, connecting with people, and then really hearing them. Sometimes it's hearing what they're not saying to you. Most of our customers are older. And so they'll say, hey, we need this. Like they can tell me their business problem easily. But how, how to fix it, they don't necessarily know. Especially the best way. 
one of the first our first customer that we had, right? I'm built I'm building out the first version of Rutbox, which is crazy because you know, mostly teams, the whole team of developers usually build out a CRM. And so it was janky. Like I was afraid to click on any button during the first demonstration because I was like I was gonna get a five hundred error or something. <laughs> and so like this the owner used to tell me, Hey, I need a button up here at the top that does this. And I'm like, dude, no, you you don't need a button up at the top of the menu bar that like runs an automated report. Like you just need to set up the automated report and you don't have to even click a button. But he couldn't he couldn't understand it. He didn't you know, he would always be like, I need that button, I need the button and I'm like finally I like give him the button and then months later, he's like, why do we have this button up here? Like, we don't need this. Like, it does it in the... I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's so important to have people around you that are both asking the right questions, but also an active listener, people that you can mm-hmm. bounce your ideas off of. Because you can be the most genius businessman ever, but if it's all in your head and you're not, you know, putting it into the real world to see how the real world reacts to it, it's all just conceptual, and you don't know if it'll actually work. So you need to have, you know, the older people around you, the younger people around you to tell yes. you, is this viable? Is this feasible? Does this actually make sense in the real world? Because, you know, everybody's super optimistic in their head. With any business idea, they can see how it's going to be crazy successful in the future, but they don't see all these realistic pitfalls in the way that, you know, the real world can offer to you. Mm-hmm. Yep. That was what was so cool about um, the entrepreneurship program at Duke. I did this last class. Um, It's the only class that the university offers in the grad school business building. And we did case studies on, like, businesses that had already, like, lived out their life. And some of them are still, you know, exist and others failed. And so our professor would take a point, like, in the middle of, like, their launch, like, or, like, after, like, five years. And we'd have to forecast their success and figure out, like, on books, like, we look at their books and forecast their success and, like, what their expected revenue and stuff would be. And then, we like, and then we'd have to determine, like, why would this fail or not fail? Why would they exceed that or not exceed that based on, like, real-world stuff, like, that, uh, like, competition or whatever it could be. And it was crazy to see, like, how, like, certain companies would fail because of some easily missed thing that, like, you know, you should have seen that Apple was going to run out BlackBerry or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that was, that was really, it was cool to see that and just learn, like, throughout the semester, like, we were learning to ask better questions. Why does this happen this way and stuff like that? And at the end of the semester, I built a good relationship with my professor because I'd say, why I would ask her, like, during class, like, why are they targeting that audience or whatever? Like, or why, like, did they not tweak this? And then she would show me a company that succeeded because they did that. Or she would be like, somebody needs to do that or something like that. And I think that was really cool. Like you were saying, it's about like learning how to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And so like after like learning, uh, witnessing all these failures or successes and determining what the factors were that resulted in the outcome, it was cool to look at. It changed completely how I viewed the, like how I viewed the, the entrepreneurship like lifestyle and like how products are developed and everything like that. 100%. Yeah, that the courses like that, classes like that are really cool. That 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 take you and put you in a fictional but like realistic world scenario. Oh, definitely. I wish like I hate that it's such a like I feel like a class like that would benefit all of these guys in the room and like, you know, Duke's really hard to get into. And it's unfortunate because I feel like there was probably eighteen people in the class and I feel like I I could tell you seventeen other guys that would guys and girls that would be way more interested and passionate and would get way more out of it than the 18 that were in 17 others that were in there. Yeah, definitely. You're the 18th. I'm the 18th. <laughs> I feel like I got a lot out of it, but like, I feel like I was like one of the only people asking like the, like the, the interesting questions that were really like, it, they weren't just looking at the numbers on the books. They were looking deeper into like the real world. Yeah. And I feel like these, like y'all would have killed the class. Y'all would have had, it's like, an entrepreneur's playground like mm-hmm. you're just looking at it and I feel like all of us would have had like I, I wish I could have taken it with like other people because I think like the room could have completely the environment could have completely changed and like I mean shit we could have made an app probably in the class and it would have <laughs> maybe rep box 2.0 or something like that yeah <laughs> I had a uh I had a similar experience but like mine was not 
the same way. So I'm an entrepreneurship minor at Texas. So I have to take entrepreneurship courses. And the first one I took last semester was just, it just felt like a complete joke. I'm like, I'm not going to, I really hope she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> um, but she, like, it wasn't, I don't think it was her at all. I think it was more so just the students I got paired with, like, cause our, we don't have like a final necessarily in the class. It's more so just a project. And so your, your job is to just, you know, come up with a project, like an idea and then like kind of sell it to the rest of the class. But you just kind of get paired with people that are, you know, they just want the grade. They don't care about actually learning through the class and like doing the trials, deciding on something that like actually makes sense. You know what I mean? The whole time I'm trying to come up with ideas that would be actually beneficial and I think could actually work in the real world. And they're just like, I like, feel like that project would be too much work. I don't want to actually go through the, you know, the interview process or the whatever we have to do, the trials, like, you know, testing everything, failing, all that stuff. Like, I don't want to put in all that work. Well, let's just make something that's bullshit, but it's easy to do for a project to get an A. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, it's the same way. I feel like if I was surrounded by people like the three of us the whole time, it would have been just a, a totally different class where I could have, we could have really like, tested boundaries and like gotten a lot out of the class yeah 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 i think some of those classes when you have an entrepreneur doing them that like when it's like oh no this isn't like pass fell like here's a right answer here's a wrong like it challenges you to think yeah into like where you're coming from in your thinking and to pivot your thinking around or just consider other things like then it opens up options and opportunities and the fact that you could make something like you could make it into something excites mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, right? And they're like, we can create, like we're not just going to pass this class, but man, we can create an incredible company. If, even if, even though it's fictitious, as long as it's realistic and it's feels real world, man, super helpful. Definitely. I had another, it was cool because I had another class um, that semester with this professor. His name was Rick Singer. And so he founded the Tiger Woods Foundation. Oh, wow. And then um, he retired and wanted to teach and stuff. So he went up to um, North Carolina and started teaching at Duke. And I would pick his brain all the time. But he would present us like weekly. We'd have these little problems. Like we would learn, it was about leadership and like what a leader is and like different leadership styles and how they like attack different scenarios. And we'd evaluate. CEOs and like how their leadership styles succeeded or failed or maybe like the company structure didn't favor their leadership style or whatever mm -hmm. it was and so he would present us with like a problem like one of them was like you're a city mayor or whatever and you have to determine like you want to build a new road but like you're gonna displace people's housing for a little bit or whatever and you have to determine what kind of leader you'll be what decisions you'll make and why that's pretty cool and I was taking the class while I was taking the entrepreneurship class and so I had like as soon as I got that problem, I was thinking about different outcomes, like, like completely like not choice A or B and Y. It was like, let's make a C and add a Y. Yeah. And, um, and that was so interesting. Cause like me and my buddy, Brandon, we worked on the project. We worked on it together, but like, we weren't like, we were in the same room writing the 500 word paper, short little paper, um, about like our answer. And like, we just discussed our answer at the end. And it was so interesting. Cause like, Pre, uh, pre going into it, I thought we'd come out with the same exact answer, but because I was taking that other class, I realized like I had, it was far, it was layered differently. Like my answer wasn't the A or B, it was the C and Y. Um, and I think it's, it's, it was super interesting because that was when I realized like, that's what I'm getting out of this class. It's not like literally what I'm learning. It's what I'm not looking for. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was super, um, that was probably the best. That was when I realized like, that's why I go to college. Like, yeah. that's what this is for. Yeah. Yeah, and that's super similar to uh, Alex Hormozzi. He's a really yeah. big, uh, I guess, business influencer, but he's really more known for his actual companies. One of his biggest things is the unknown unknowns. You don't know the things that could offer you so many possibilities in the future. You can make $100 million just from this one certain thing, you don't know what you don't know. Yep. And that's why it's so important to be a lifelong learner, a student of all these other people. Always look at a certain situation, a certain conversation, especially with either someone who you believe is way ahead of you or even, uh, you know, farther or coming along the path. Mm -hmm. You can learn from absolutely everybody. You can, 100%. Uh, there's a saying in AA that's... Uh, 
Some day, some days I'm the teacher, some days I'm the student, and then some days I'm the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. My professor, hey. he was talking about how it was cool, like when he's Rick, he was, because he's a relatively older guy, super cool dude. I would pick his brain after class every day because I just wanted to learn from him. And, um, yeah, and he was like, it's cool being a teacher because, like, now I'm being asked questions by a younger audience, and they're changing the way I ever thought of things. Because times have changed, and, like, it was, there, we're adding layers, like like you said about earlier, like how, like, you, you learn from, like, people like our age. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, like, it was, like, the way he thinks about things change because, like, a student will ask a question, and he'll be like, I didn't really think about incorporating that kind of idea to it because that's just not really what, it's changing, like, the way everything's structured, I feel like, the thought process. And he really enjoys, like, he's learning as much as he's teaching. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of older people, they feel like th there's a fear. There's a lot of fear around learning from younger guys, especially around tech and stuff like that, that they think that they'll look stupid or they'll think that they'll lose power as, like, the all-knowing leader or whatever. And it's that's false. Like, you can hold your authority, I mean, like, as a company of making, like, really the thing is you want to, you want them invested. You want those guys working hard and smart and loving it. You want them happy and growing, and you want to use all their knowledge, right, for the betterment of the company. It's going to do you better. It's going to do the company better. Like that, there's, but they don't, there's a lot of fear around that with older, older guys. I see that a lot, that they're afraid to learn from younger guys because of, well, whatever, whatever reasons there are there. It, and they're af also afraid to step in to help, help mentor or guide them as well. Um, it, there's, I, I feel like it's a disadvantage for older guys a lot. Um, I've seen it a lot. But once you really connect with them and grow with them, like, I mean, I'm, I, I help a lot of older guys, especially around tech stuff, that, man, I respect them more because I've been able, they've let me help them or, or come to me for guidance or advice on stuff. You end up respecting them more for that stuff and going to them for mentorship as well because I've made that connection with them. Um, we got to wrap it up because I have to take a call okay. here in a second. This has been awesome. We need to, we should probably do this again. I'm definitely down to do this again. I'm so down. Yeah, this was a great time. Yeah. I'm here all summer. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so Please. much, Dave. This is a great podcast. Yeah. Out. I'm late.